Hey, uh, today we have with us Dr. Peter Wilf. He is from the Pennsylvania State University. He's a professor of uh, geosciences, and he's also a research associate with the Smithsonian Institution with a focus on paleobotany. So we're happy to have him today to, uh, as we partner with WPSU in our Science Around the Globe uh, series. So uh, Dr. Wilf, thank you for uh, being with us today. Thank you too, Justin. How are you today? Now I'm doing really well, I, and you know I know it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and we've had some great researchers, and and we're we're following suit with uh, having you here today. So, um, you know, as we get started, we're really trying to focus on trying to inspire students. We're trying to inspire young kids to to explore careers and you know see what uh, opportunities are out there. So, you know, if we could start you. with really what inspired you to go into the field. Well, a lot of things. I, I love discovery. Um, I love nature, and I've had some really important teachers who've pointed me along the way. So there's really no substitute for fantastic mentors who just kind of lead you to something without pushing you into it, but just take you to the brink of it. I've had some important formative experiences. Um, back when I was a middle school teacher teaching seventh and eighth graders, I took a, I discovered the amazing plants that live today in southern New Jersey in the Pine Barrens area. These include plants that eat insects and plants that have just outrageous lifestyles and amazing orchids. And I spent an entire summer photographing those plants and learning them. And that was really my first experience in botany. And before that, I wasn't even really a botanist. And I think my uh, evolution um, gene turned on, so to speak, also from teaching middle school. Um, teaching seventh and eighth graders evolution as a science teacher made me want to study it. And we put, when, we, when we put together plants and evolution, that leads to plant fossils, which is what I study because not all fossils are dinosaurs. In fact, very, very few fossils are dinosaurs. So as I pursued various uh, opportunities to study evolution, I found that fossil plants was the most exciting thing. And it also has taken me to, the, to all the corners of the earth. So I've had the incredible opportunity to work with fantastic people um, from professors to students, just um, all over the world in Asia and in South America and in North America, of course, which is, I got started right here in Wyoming and Australia. Um, and it's just been fantastic uh, traveling everywhere. And that's also just a, a big appeal of doing this kind of work. Not only get to discover things, but you get to see the world. And um, I speak at least 10 languages badly and I've eaten every kind of food and I've worked with every kind of person everywhere. And it's such a thrill. And I know that in your lab or, uh, you know, your lab is, is sometimes the outdoors uh, a lot of times and you enjoy that. I know it's not a, a one person job and I know you have a, probably a great team. And you know, if you could take a moment and just really discuss some of your team members work or your labs work, um, you know, what do you do on the field? Oh, okay. Well, there, I guess there's two things to deal with there. There's what we do in the field and then there's what all the people do. So we'll start with the people because they're, they're the most important. Um, so I, I work with dozens and dozens of students and researchers here at Penn State and all over the world uh, within the U.S., outside the U.S. Um, and, you know, again, it's just one of the great pleasures of my job is to work with uh, so many different kinds of people. And I think the you know, the really exciting thing is that we're, there's so much to do and we're just putting the students right on the front lines. So we find something interesting, like a new fossil site or the student finds a new fossil site. You know, we just, here, here you go, here's your thesis. You know, here's the huge unexplored area that you can go into. Just again, to emphasize one of the great pleasures of my job is that I, I, I've, I've taken literally hundreds of students out to find their very first fossil. And that's, this is a photo gallery of Penn State students finding their very first fossil somewhere in the, uh, <laughs> somewhere around the country. Um, so I had a student just a few years ago, actually while slipping down a hill, she discovered um, a, a fossil temperate rainforest in Argentina. This was after an entire day of not finding any fossils. So she discovered this site. So, so that was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, that, you know, that same student you know, ended up describing what happened in the Southern hemisphere to the plants at the time of the dinosaur extinction. And, um, you know, I guess as a graduate student myself, you know, I was given that there aren't very many paleobotanists and so there's a huge opportunity here. Most fossils are still on the ground, even of dinosaurs. So even when I'm done, there'll be plenty left over for the students listening to this. 
Uh, there's lots and lots still to do. Um, so even as a graduate student, I was given, quote unquote, you know, a lot of the Western US. You know, so I ended up for the for the area that I was working in, you know, with basically this whole sou southern half of Wyoming as my field area. So we we we, we take students in the field, we put them on the front lines of discovery, and they they go all the way from the field to uh, the lab to publishing the papers, right? So building their reputations, building their careers, because they have to be able to do you know to have a career once they're done with school. That's mm -hmm. still the idea around here. <laughs> and what we do in the field is we, um, you know, we look, we're, we're looking for fossils and we're finding them and we're collecting them and we're putting them in the appropriate museum. So that, that can be the Smithsonian here in the United States. If we're working in a foreign country, it's a, it's a museum in that country. And we're working with the professional scientists from that museum. Museums are incredible places. Uh, people think about museums as public exhibits. Um, but the public exhibits are really just a fraction of what museums actually have. Museums are the storehouses of biodiversity um, um, and, our, and much else, history and culture from all over the world. And you know, more than 99% of museum objects are, are not on display, but they're available for researchers, they're available for students. So we spend a lot of time, not just in the field, but in the museums. Now in the field, um, you can see an image of our uh, flagship fossil outcrop called Laguna de Lunco in Argentina behind me. That's in Southern Argentina. So it's about the same latitude as Penn State, but in the Southern hemisphere, you see the Southern cross at night and the sun rises in the Northeast. So are you confused yet? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is the, just the greatest place uh, anyone could ever ask to have as a field area because there are fossils everywhere. So all those white rocks you see in the image behind me are full of fossils fossil trees, fossil leaves, fossil insects, fossil fish, uh, fossil birds, fossil turtles, and fossil frogs. Um, and you know, just every time we go, we, we find new things. So, you know, you need to develop an eye. People often ask, how do you know where to go? So, you know, we're scientists, we put together the evidence, we look at old reports, we talk to people, we go on discoveries that people uh, have reported to us, and we find new stuff. And so we have a trained eye for the particular kinds of rocks that have the fossils that you're looking for. Well, that's, uh, that's amazing. That uh, photo behind you, the landscape is, is really, that is really an amazing. What a place, you know, white yeah. rocks. And <laughs> it's probably, it, it's probably oh, indescribable to be honest with you. It's indescribable, I'm sure. There's like, a, that's like a mile of fossils behind me and it's 170 meters thick, right? So uh, with, with rocks represent time. So there's several hundred thousand years of, of earth time there behind me. And we have this, another thing that we do, we don't just find fossils and give think, names to things. We interpret things biologically and on and on and on. We even interpret, we even look for the little bites that marks that insects make when they eat fossil leaves, for example. And we've been able to determine quite a lot about earth history and climate change just from that. But we also, we do our basic geology also. So we figure out what kind of environment this was. This was actually a volcanic caldera. So there was a huge eruption. Um, and um, the, the, white bet, the white rocks that you see represent mud and volcanic ash that fell into an ancient lake after an eruption, kind of like the Yellowstone caldera, but in a much, much warmer climate. Uh, but we also date the rocks. So we find the little, the special uh, minerals that are earth clocks that are called uh, zircons and sanadines. And you know, we have some of the best laboratories in the world that can analyze these grains and tell you how old the, the eruption was that made those grains. Um, and therefore we have very precise ages for our fossils. And that's a really important part of our research. If you don't know how old your rocks are, they don't really mean a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I know as you're, uh, you're talking about different places you've been in the world, um, you know, and I know that you know, you've done some some great things and, and great research. What what current research are you working on now uh, in your uh, field? Well, we have sort of a mega project now that's that's putting together several different threads of and is involving a whole lot of different labs. Um, and so we have principal collaborators all over the world, and right here in the U.S. at Cornell and Brown Universities working on this. So the threads that we're putting together are um, the paleobotany of Argentina, which has been a 20 year project, very successful one represented by the image behind me. Um, and we're putting that together with the history of the Southeast Asian rainforest. 
Yeah, so you might think that that's ridiculous, right? Those have nothing to do with each other. But because of the way Earth history works, and maybe I should show you a graphic about this to show you what the connection is. You know, everything I do is not just studying things that I find in the ground, but we put them in the context of geology. So to be a paleontologist, you need to know both Earth history, Earth science, and life science. So we think about changing Earth, changing climate, evolution and extinction. These are the things that give us changing life. So on the right, you can see a graphic of the six great mass extinctions and how, when they happened from the dinosaur extinction, 76% loss of species 66 million years ago and the more mass extinctions going back half a billion years in time and the reasons why these might've happened. Uh, the only one we know very, very well is the dinosaur extinction because that was caused by an asteroid strike in Mexico. And it'll, amazing group of people right here at Penn State is studying that, um, as well as the paleobotanists like myself and, our, and the students who are studying that. And we have the modern day extinction, which is sort of like a slow motion train wreck. We don't know how much is going to be lost. Um, and then on the left, you can see a graphic of the Southern Hemisphere. If you look through time, so this is millions of years ago. This is 300 million years ago. And then you can see the uh, outlines of the continents, right? So here's Africa. Sorry, South America, excuse me. This is Africa. Uh, this is the great southern supercontinent of Gondwana. And it starts to, under immense pressure from the Earth's interior, the continents begin to break apart. Um, so the first thing that happens is the South Atlantic opens, right? Um, and then we get the separation of Africa, the separation of India, uh, with Madagascar attached to it. But South America, Antarctica, and Australia remain connected. So if you can imagine this is really important to people studying dinosaurs or plants because these uh, once these continents are separated, that dramatically affects uh, evolution. It, it, it constrains certain groups of animals and plants to the areas that, that are not separated by ocean. So if we go forward to 50 million years, we have still Gondwana. This is what the earth looked like 50 million years ago. It was very, very warm and we still have uh, South America, Antarctica, and Australia very closely um, um, connected, right? And then we're working here in South America. So the climate is warm. It's so warm. This is the time of the first primates and horses. And we've known for a long time that primates and horses and their relatives went marched across the Northern Hemisphere because it was so warm. So we see the same kinds of animals in Asia and Europe and North America. What we're discovering is the southern part of this story, that there was a connection across Antarctica at this time as well. Uh, but what happens next is that South America and Australia separate. Australia goes north into Asia. Um, and we end up with this ancient rainforest. Uh, the ancient rainforest organisms are sort of sheltered on Australia, and then it collides into Asia. So, so we actually find in South America a whole lot of fossils of living organisms that live in the mountains of Borneo and New Guinea and, and Australia is just incredible. And those areas are severely at risk. Uh, Southeast Asia has some of the highest extinction rates right now in the world and the highest deforestation rates. So we're, we're making a direct connection between the ancient forests of South America and the endangered modern forests of uh, Southeast Asia. So I think we really have a story about preserving evolutionary history and, and how fossils can tell us about um, evolutionary history that, um, and sort of one, an example of that, oh, well, I should really, actually, I should show some more pictures. So if we go back to, uh, if we go back to Argentina, here we are digging at Laguna de Lunco in Patagonia and celebrating that we've made a, a fossil quarry, <laughs> right? We have a good time in the field, we eat well. Then we go back to the museum that we collaborate with, which is called the MEF. Um, and all these drawings are from an upcoming children's book by, uh, by Rebecca Wilf. Here's the real MEF museum where all our fossils are in Argentina with a giant petrified trunk in front. We prepare the fossils. We have 8,000 fossils just for one site, 20,000 fossils altogether, just at this museum. And then we see that the living relatives of, uh, of these plants, of the fossils, are found in Southeast Asia. This is Southeast Asia. And here are the examples. So this is where the plants live now. 
they're, they're most of them are extinct in South America because it's got cold and dry and they've kind of tracked Gondwana and the breakup of Gondwana and they now live in Southeast Asia where they're endangered. So this is, so there's an amazing conservation message out of this work. Um, so here's, here's just one of them. This is a, uh, this is a relative of the oak that we call the Asian chinkapin. And it kind of looks like a, an oak. It has a, a nut that has acorn. It looks like an acorn, but the cup of the acorn goes around the nut. And you can see the nut here sitting inside the scaly cup. It's just amazing. And you can see the, the acorn, so to speak, coming out where the thing is splitting open. And this is something that lives in Southeast Asia today. In fact, this is the first evidence ever from the Southern Hemisphere. We published it just a couple of years ago for the entire oak family ever having been present um, in the Southern Hemisphere. And we found a, uh, one of the most important trees in Southeast Asia actually used to live in the Southern Hemisphere. So that's just to give you a flavor. Sure. Um, you know, that sort of ties into our, our next uh, question that I have, the environmental impact mm -hmm. uh, of your research. You know, it seems like you're, you're going everywhere from climate change to extinction, if you could elaborate on that a little bit. The, uh, the, the organisms that we're finding as fossils are now dominant trees in the most deforested areas of the planet, the most imperiled areas of the planet. The this Southeast Asian region is just as diverse as the Brazilian Amazon, but it's much more populated. Um, the, the plants and animals that live there have many fewer places to go because there's so many islands, so they have to cross salt water to move. Um, a, a lot of these living fossils that we study live in the mountains. They'd have to cross oil palm and lowlands, cleared areas, to get anywhere. Um, so this really represents it perfectly. Right in northern, uh, in North Sumatra, which is part of Indonesia, um, just a few years ago, a new species of orangutan was described called the Tapanuli orangutan. It's distinct from the from the, in, the the other orangutans that live in the northern part of this island, big island of Sumatra in in, in Indonesia. There are only about 800 of them, and their their forest habitat is shrinking and shrinking um, from uh, mining operations that are happening near there. And here they are sitting in one of our living fossils. The kind of tree they're sitting in here is one of the most common fossils we have in Argentina. And they actually eat um, fruits and seeds that came from Antarctica, literally. Uh, so that's sort of an embodiment of it, um, <laughs> that the, the, the plants that we're finding in the Southern Hemisphere are, um, are really important today to hundreds of thousands of species. If you, know, you think of the orangutan as your flagship, but you know, think of all the insects that live there too, and all the specialized fungi and uh, microbes that live in this kind of an environment and small plants that live on the big plants. It just goes on and on and on. Um, so another message is that when you're trying to, when you want to conserve an area, uh, there are things called world heritage sites, for example, that are run by UNESCO, uh, part of the United Nations. And one of the criteria for having a world heritage site is that it represents evolutionary history. It represents uh, change through time. It represents rare organisms that have fossil records uh, because you want to preserve these uh, areas that, that are rich in living fossils. They inspire people um, and they actually preserve a record of life, a living record of ancient life. So I think in our work, we really do connect the ancient to the modern um, in, in, a, in a compelling way. And we show that, you know, another dimension to conserving these forests, in addition to all the other reasons, is that they actually conserve evolution. If you remove them, you remove really important inf information about how the life on the planet evolved. Now, another tool that we've been using um, to tie together a lot of this is uh, machine vision. So we're using computers now to help identify for the first time, we're just developing the techniques to help identify fossil leaves that we're discovering by uh, the tens of thousands. So we're integrating um, paleobotany from from uh, South America and Southeast Asia. We've done field work in Vietnam also, and uh, just recently, right before COVID, we had an amazing field trip in Vietnam. Uh, Brunei, uh, in, um, uh, which is in a, a small country in Borneo, we found the first plant fossils ever from that whole country. And we're finding some of the first fossils from plant fossils from Borneo that have been described in something like a hundred years. And we're, so we're, we're putting together this story, plus the, the paleo conservation, plus the machine vision to help us identify all this. So it's, an, it's incredibly fertile because our team includes many different kinds of paleontologists, of course, 
and geologists, but it also includes um, people who do computer vision. You know, people who are trying to reverse engineer the human brain itself, mm -hmm. some of the best computer vision labs uh, in the world. Uh, we work with Tomas Serres lab at the Brown University um, are working on this problem. They, they recognize it as important you know, we're, and are helping us. So we have computer vision and paleontology and geology and conservation sort of all wrapped together. Uh, as we talk about, you know, you, you've mentioned paleontology a lot and you know, paleobotany is a, a specialized field. Can you explain what paleo botany is or paleontologist would be like the, exactly what does that mean to our to the kids listening out there today oh yeah hi kids <laughs> well first of all paleontology in my unbiased opinion is by far the most fun science and and fossils are just finding fossils is just the greatest thing um and there are plenty of fossils right here in town in state college not so many of plants but there's even there is even a fossil plant site not too far away paleontology is the study of ancient life that's literally what it is, and the and the and the evolution of life through time. Um, so what it means is that we piece together the history of life, and you know we put that in the context of the of the dynamic changing planet, as I've shown you, uh, based on evidence from fossils. Sure, that, I think that's a simple explanation that uh, everybody could understand. So yeah, well, it, it breaks down. There, there are different parts of it. So people mm -hmm. who study dinosaurs and fossil mammals or, or we call them verte vertebrate paleontologists because they study animals with a backbone. Mm -hmm. um, the, by far the most common kind of fossils is uh, critters with hard shells that used to live in the ocean. Uh, clams, for example, <laughs> corals, and many, many, many other things. Um, and there's so those folks, those colleagues we call invertebrate paleontologists. Mm -hmm. So an undergrad right here at Penn State just a few years ago found a, found a 460 million year old starfish in Pine Grove Mills. Oh wow! Yeah, and now she's I mean, these these things really get people excited. You know, she's got off to a career in paleontology. She's in her PhD program. Yeah, that's uh, you know that, that's really cool that it, it exists close close to home. Yeah, and if you study fossil plants, you're a paleobotanist, and if you study uh, uh, tiny things that require a microscope, spores, pollen, little tiny uh, plankton in the ocean, then you're a micropaleontologist. Um, and so, so you know, there, 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 are a lot of, there are a lot of dimensions to this. Um, but, to, you know, we have to collaborate because life isn't just clams and life isn't just dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are really rare fossils. Everybody wants to study them. But, um, you know, they're, if, you, if you took all the dinosaurs, that ever lived, uh, was, he took all the dinosaur fossils, excuse me, and spread them out evenly over the whole time that dinosaurs were around 160 million years. You'd have one fossil every 50,000 years or so. That's how rare oh. they are as fossils. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, is last thing is we, we really try to finish up is, you know, we're trying to inspire students. You know, we're, we're trying to, you know, help middle school That's students. That's what we do, man. Elementary school students to really, you know, get uh, get excited about science. And what advice would you give a a kid today that would be interested in entering a field such as yours? Well, the most important thing is is to stay interested, right? <laughs> Not to lose that interest. So whatever got you interested, hold on to that, right? So if it was watching some of the dinosaur shows, great, keep watching them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it was reading particular books. Um, there are so many wonderful books about fossils. So for that age group, I'd recommend Hannah Bonner's books that, are, that illustrate life through time just beautifully in cartoon graphic novel format and all scientific, scientifically accurate. Um, but you know, to be a paleontologist, you've got to be a naturalist first. So you've got to pay attention to the natural world in all its forms, right? You're not going to get anywhere if, if all you can do is identify one kind of dinosaur tooth. Or you know, if you know T Rex and nothing else, right? So you got to pay attention. And fortunately, here in State College, we're in a beautiful area with lots of nature. And you, all you have to do is go to the woods or even just your backyard, right? And you, you can you can you can see insects, you can see trees, you can watch how they grow, you can watch the behaviors, you can start to read about them. Um, you know, one of the most fun things right now is is the nature apps like iNaturalist that help you identify plants and animals. If you just go for a walk in the woods. You go to a stream, you know, there are fish, there are uh, lizards and snakes, and you, and you can learn to identify them, you can learn their behaviors, 
Uh, we have the fantastic summer programs like Science U and the Shavers Creek summer camps. Um, so if those are possible, I highly recommend those for, for really, getting, uh, really getting tuned into nature. So you've really got to be a naturalist. You can't do this just by staring at a phone. It just doesn't work. You've got, you've got to get out there, look at animals, look at plants, look at rocks, you know, play with your dog even. Just, just think about how the natural world works and why it came to be the way it is. And just keep developing those interests because it comes from inside you, right? Nobody can tell you. I can't say you're interested in fossils. It doesn't work that way. You have to be interested yourself and figure out why you're interested. So, and it's usually discovery driven, like you find something. So the student found a starfish, fossil starfish, almost half a billion years old. You know, she's off to a career in paleo. And I, that changed her forever. So you kind of look for those experiences that change you forever. Now, as you go on in school, if you get, uh, you know, you know you, to be uh, any kind of scientist, you need your basic sciences, you need your math, you need your chemistry, you need your physics, you need your biology, you need your earth science. Fortunately, our school system here you know, covers all of those pretty well, quite very well, in fact. What am I even saying? Beautifully. <laughs> and uh, and um, so that's all available. Because, you know, so, so you want to learn all of that. And then like to be a paleontologist, you need to know both biology and geology. So when you really get later in that phase, um, you know, you've got to know both your uh, biology and your geology. So you know, being a double major or a major minor is sort of a classic way to approach that once you get to college. So it's a lot of science and there's a lot of reading, but really it's just a lot of fun. As long as you're having fun with it and it's what you want to do, you're going to find your way. Well, we definitely have a lot of opportunities around here. And, and I know that- yeah, uh, yeah, we really do. It's really true. We have a world-class fossil site just north of Lock Haven. It's called Red Hill. And it has, um, it has a complete ecosystem from 359 million years ago that includes the, old, that includes the oldest limbed animals in North America, with like like shoulders and 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 legs, and uh, vertebrate animals, so sort of salamander like, but they're representing that first transition onto land. It has uh, many kinds of sharks and extinct fish with armor and spines. It has uh, it has fossils of the oldest trees and the oldest seed plants. So there's a website where you can learn about that. It's called DevoniansTimes.org, and you can, and that that's local, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can actually drive there and, and uh, see it for yourself. Well, we're less than an hour away for sure. And, uh, you know, Dr. Wolf, I, I really appreciate, you know, taking the time and, you know, sharing some of your experiences with us. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, like I said, our goal is to really motivate students to, to realize that there's careers, you know, out there that, that are outside of central Pennsylvania and, and all over the world. And you've definitely uh, brought that to light today. And, and I do appreciate, uh, you know, taking the time uh, you know, with us today. I don't know if there's any parting thoughts you want to you want to add as we uh, close up. Well, just like it says, as you leave Shavers Creek Environmental Center, never stop discovering. So put down your phones, go outside, and just take a look at all the things that are happening in nature. And uh, and that's my advice. Good morning. Today we'll be looking for fossils, just like Dr. Wilf. However, instead of looking in Patagonia, we'll be looking right here in central Pennsylvania. To help us find the best places, we'll be using the DCNR's PA Geode website to learn more about our local rocks. Remember, only take rocks from places you have permission. For almost all state parks and other public land, taking anything or damaging rocks is off limits. Our first site will be Spring Creek Canyon between State College and Belfont. If you live in a limestone valley like near Lamar, Loganton, Belfont, State College, Spruce Creek, or Reedsville, you live on top of some of the oldest rocks in central Pennsylvania, about 450 million years old. These rocks were formed in a shallow tropical sea, so any fossils that you find will likely be shells. We don't have many natural limestone outcrops around here, and limestone is hard to break apart, so here's another option. If you just find limestone gravel like in your driveway, it's quarried locally, super easy to find. Next, we'll look at some slightly younger rocks. You'll find shale, mudstone, and sandstone in some of our other valleys. If you live in places like Lock Haven, Milesburg, Port Matilda, Altoona, Lewistown, or any of the Susquehanna Valley between Williamsport and Harrisburg, this is what you'll find when you start digging. I'll be looking in Milesburg along Bald Eagle Creek, where I noticed fossils during Science U's ecology camp a few years back. Fossils are a bit harder to find in these valleys, as many of the shales were formed in water too deep to have too many interesting fossils. However, according to PA Geode, this is probably the old port formation, and it seems to have a ton of fossil shells. 
Finally, we'll be headed up to the Allegheny Front to look at some of the youngest rocks in the area. If you're from northern or western PA or have coal mines in your area, these are the rocks you're most likely to see. The most common rock over most of this area is sandstone, which is pretty boring, honestly. It's made of sand, what else can we say? But these are the rocks that we're interested in today. Coal is made of old, dead plants, and the shale around coal beds can have really neat fossils. Shale also splits apart really easily, so it's easy to look for new fossils in between each tiny layer. These rocks are around 300 million years old, and by that point, land animals were more common, so if you're insanely lucky, you might find a fossil bone. However, dinosaurs still don't exist for millions of years after this rock was formed, so you won't be finding any of them. You're much more likely to find plant fossils. I'm no fossil expert, but I think these are leaves from a seed fern. Now it's your turn. Grab an adult, search for PA geode on the internet, and see what kind of cool rocks are in your area. Good luck.